Hi guys, welcome or welcome back. Thank you so much for being here. It's so greatly appreciated. It truly, truly is. Before we get started, a few things. Let me give you my usual disclaimer that this video is for educational purposes only. Please do not take what I say as fact. Please always do your own research and come to your own conclusions. Next, if you have not liked, subscribed, or commented yet, please consider doing so. It only takes a couple seconds and it really helps me out. Next, this is one of the harder stories to hear so if you are on the fence about whether you want to hear a pretty gruesome story, I would suggest not watching this one, clicking off and going to a different video. Lastly, a huge thank you to my subscriber, Jenna Dietz, for bringing this video to my attention. And with that, let's get started. 30-year-old. Jenna Lee Daughtry was born on November 8, 1979 in Mount Pleasant, Pennsylvania. She was mentally disabled, so even though she was 30 years old, she had the mental capacity of a 14-year-old and the IQ of a 71-year-old. She loved to dance and sing. She was very easygoing. She was very trusting. She liked to have fun. She made friends easily. And it said that once you were her friend, you were her friend forever. This would also be a downside to Jennifer. She was way too trusting. But... She never let her disability stop her from living the most normal life po possible. And although her parents were concerned, they helped Jennifer to feel the sorts of independence that most of us take for granted. She was very excited to tell her parents that she had just made a new group of friends at an adult community center in Greensburg, Pennsylvania, which is about 10 miles away from Mount Pleasant. 17-year-old Angela Marinucci was the first friend that Jennifer made from those that would later be dubbed the Greensburg Six. Angela, who also had mental disabilities, which was described by mutual friends as very polite, very helpful, and having impeccable manners. The girls had an instant connection and they would spend every free moment together. Sometime into their friendship, Angela introduces Jennifer to her new boyfriend, 24-year-old Ricky Smyrns. Ricky was described as charming, handsome, a real ladies' man. And not long after meeting Jennifer, Ricky begins hitting on her to make Angela jealous. When Angela finds out that her best friend's man has been flirting with her, she's furious and she confronts Jennifer. Don't they always? Jennifer, who hates conflict, apologizes profusely, and promises Angela that she has no interest in her boyfriend. Angela accepts Jennifer's apology, but she doesn't mean it. In fact, she is actually still harboring a lot of resentment towards Jennifer. So Jennifer, believing that her fight with Angela is over starts going to a community outreach center okay this is where they will teach her how to gain independence and how to accomplish her true goal of having an apartment angela's mother also begins sending her to the same 
outreach program. But for very different reasons. Angela gets suspended from school for fighting and she gets kicked out of a library for fighting. So she sent there for anger management, behavioral problems, and depression. Oddly enough, Angela's boyfriend, Ricky Smerns, is court ordered to attend the same community center. What are the odds? that Angela and Jennifer are attending as part of a court-ordered probation for assault and burglary. Okay, so because there are so many players in this story, let's start with Angela and Ricky. Angela Lynn Marinucci was born on July 14th 1992, in 2008, at the age of 15, Angela suffers a head injury when she is hit by a truck. This event would end up altering Angela's behavior and she would begin to spiral. Two mental experts testify in court that Angela suffered from depression and stated that she may have had drug and alcohol abuse issues. Ricky Van Edward Smerns was born on March 6, 1986. His mom was a sex worker in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania and was addicted to... And his father was a gang member in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He spent his childhood in and out of foster homes and began being treated for mental health issues at the age of four. Four. He suffered countless and neglect until he was finally rescued by the Smyrns family when he was 10 years old. It would later come out in court that Ricky Smyrns suffered from physical and from his father and uncle, real father and uncle, not adopted father and uncle. He tried beer, the white stuff that goes up your nose, and marijuana by the age of six, by the age of six years old. Oh my God. Six. He was diagnosed with PTSD at the age of 8, and by the age of 10, he had already attended more than 103 therapy sessions. He was diagnosed with 7 different personalities and 15 different psychiatric issues. In 1997, Smyrns burglarizes his neighbor's home and he steals knives, guitars, coins, bullets, and cash. That same year, he essays a woman in the basement of her home. In December of 2009, Ricky and Angela are still dating. And Ricky moves into an apartment with friends that the trio had made at the community center. In December of 2009, Ricky and Angela are still dating. And Ricky moves into an apartment with Friends that the trio had met at the community center. Jennifer also begins hanging out at the apartment as well. And while there, Ricky begins to kick his flirting up a few notches. 
by February of 2010, Jennifer gives in to her crush and she sleeps with Ricky multiple times. Okay. The betrayal would stay secret until one day Angela hears Jennifer and Ricky on the phone and realizes what has been going on behind her back. Angela is understandably furious and betrayed. And to be honest, I don't blame her. That I don't blame her for. However, cutting ties with both Jennifer and Ricky forever would have been the right thing to do. Angela clearly doesn't do the right thing. Otherwise, we wouldn't sit, be sitting here talking about her, right? Angela prefers rage and revenge. That rage would only intensify when Angela finds out that Jennifer has gotten her own apartment and is moving out of her parents' home. Okay, so we know that this is all Jennifer has ever wanted, right? But because Angela believes that the reason Jennifer is moving out is so that she could have a love nest for her and Ricky. It's ridiculous. I say this is ridiculous because this is all Jennifer has ever wanted. Monday, February 8th, 2010, Angela texts Jennifer and invites her to a sleepover at the Greensburg apartment of Ricky. That morning, Jennifer leaves her mother a note that reads, Mom, I hope you have a wonderful day at work. I love you very much, Jennifer. Her stepfather then drops her off at the bus station and Jennifer is headed to Greensburg. This would have actually worked out perfectly for Jennifer because she had a doctor's appointment the following morning, Tuesday, February 9th at 3 o'clock. So she had planned to attend her doctor's appointment and then head home. Here we go. It is alleged by Ricky Smerns that Jennifer asked him to have sex with her that night and that he angrily refused. Which is funny because he had already slept with her behind his girlfriend Angela's back and he was also married at the time best friend and Ricky's girlfriend was at the Knights Hotel for the evening okay at the apartment were Jennifer Ricky Melvin Knight his pregnant girlfriend Amber Meidinger Robert Masters and Peggy Miller. Okay, let's talk Melvin Knight. Melvin Knight was born on October 27th, 1989 to a father who found himself incarcerated when Melvin was very, very young. He would end up having a um, he would end up having lifelong issues with learning and social skills after falling out of a moving vehicle at the age of five. Obviously, not his fault. That's that's not his fault. That's terrible. Actually, I feel terrible for it for that. Okay, so the following morning which would be the Tuesday. Ricky Smurns calls his girlfriend, Angela Marinucci, 
at the Knights Hotel, and he tells her that Jennifer solicited him for sex the previous night. Oh, you poor, poor thing. <laughs> Is this true? The world may never know. Tuesday, February 9th, 2010. Jennifer had a 3 o'clock doctor's appointment that day, but she decided to blow it off in the morning. Not for any particular reason that I know of. It seems as if she just didn't feel like going. We've all been there before, right? Smarns and Knight decided to argue with her about it. it <laughs> Which is so weird to me because it's like, why is it your fucking business? Why is it any of your damn business? Why do you care if she blows off her doctor's appointment? Jennifer decides to take a shower and while showering, the friends begin to go through her purse. According to court documents, they poured toothpaste and mouthwash on her belongings and on her clothes. Then they took her cell phone, cash, and a gift card from her purse. When Jennifer finally emerges from the shower, Melvin Knight demands that she go buy him cigarettes from the money that he just stole from her. After she refuses, they then begin to strike her on the head with empty bottles. When Jennifer had finally had enough, she calls Melvin Knight an, an asshole, understatement. He then proceeds to push her into a wall and... A short time later, Angela Marinucci arrives at the apartment to confront her once best friend about attempting to sleep with her boyfriend. But the best part about the whole thing, guys, Ricky Smurns is married. Yep, he's still married. <laughs> and Angela knows about that. She then pushes Jennifer into a towel rack. Not once, not twice, but three times. And lies to Melvin. Knight's pregnant girlfriend Amber by telling her that Jennifer likes Melvin as well. Melvin and Ricky then drag Jennifer from the bathroom and begin to pour spices over her head before forcing her to take another shower. After the shower, Jennifer is dragged into the attic by Knight and Smartens. God. They then force her to remove her pajamas and they throw them on the roof. They cut her hair and then they demand that she clean up the hair that they just cut. Melvin Knight then shoves a sock into her mouth and he proceeds to... R word her. <sighs> Police were actually called to the residence by neighbors that heard screaming. But the six were able to convince the police that everything was fine. And the police end up leaving without ever checking on the house, which means they never end up checking on Jennifer. So imagine going through all of this already and your only sign of help, the only sign of freedom, the only thing that's going to get you out of this drives away. What a crushing, crushing blow. Like, what a crushing blow, right? Jennifer would survive that night. The following morning, 
Angela, Melvin, and Ricky leave to go cash a check. Before leaving, Ricky threatens the others with physical harm if any of them let Jennifer leave or help Jennifer leave. When the trio return, Angela sits on Jennifer's stomach and begins to punch her in the face. That's when Jennifer knees Angela in the stomach. Good for you, girl. Okay, so what does Angela do? Angela runs to Ricky and tells Ricky that Jennifer has just killed their baby, claiming that she's pregnant. Okay, first of all, she's not pregnant. Second of all, that's not quite how it works. Angela goes on to tell Ricky Smurms that he had to choose between her or Jennifer, and that if he chose her, Jennifer has to go. The group then decides to have a family meeting. After said meeting, Angela pees in a cup and Amber forces her to drink it while striking her with the towel rack. When that wasn't enough for them, they force her to consume feces that's mixed with urine, spices, parsley, and garlic while again striking her with the towel rack. When that was still not enough, they force her to drink Clorox water and cigarette ashes. Throughout this entire ordeal, Jennifer was not surprisingly crying and vomiting. This is the absolute definition of evil. Knowing that they had to get rid of her so that she wouldn't be able to talk, the group forces Jennifer to write a unaliving note. Hello, friends. I know I'm changed. Um, I had to go to my son's trick or trunk, so that's why I'm in different clothes. Okay. Let's finish this. Where have I even left off? <laughs> okay. The unaliving note. So, they made uh, Jennifer write a note that reads, I haven't been very happy for a while, and I also feel that everybody would be better without me on Earth. I will always love my mom and stepdad, no matter what, and I will always love the rest of my family also. My nieces and nephews would be lucky to have a better aunt than me. I am done with life, Jennifer. After she was done being forced to write the letter, Jennifer was dragged into the bathroom where she was by Smurns and Knight before they slit her wrists. <sighs> As if that was not enough, they decided to, as she lay there, dying. The torture would finally end 33 hours after it began. It's a long time. A long time. After she was gone, she was wrapped in Christmas lights and garland, placed into a garbage can, like trash, and left at the Greensburg Salem Middle School. Then the Greensburg Six went home and went to bed, as if nothing ever happened. Jennifer would be discovered later that morning underneath a man's work truck in the school parking lot. The worker contacted police who would begin an immediate investigation. Because Jennifer left the name and number of where she would be staying, it was fairly easy for the police to figure out who had done this. Which is why this 
so, so, so important to let people know where you're going to be. She was smart. She was a smart girl because had she not, who knows how long it would have taken to solve this or if they ever would have, right? Okay, so. <sighs> Angela Marinucci, the so-called best friend, was sentenced to life in prison. Ricky Smurns was sentenced to death, as he should be. I think they all should be, but that's besides the point. I think that even though they didn't all play equal roles in this, they all played equal roles in this because they allowed it to happen for 33 hours. Melvin Knight was sentenced to death. Melvin's pregnant fiance, Amber, was sentenced to 40 to 80 years. Peggy Miller was sentenced to 12 to 24 years. And Robert Lauren Masters Jr. was sentenced to 20 to 40 years for third degree. 7 to 20 years for conspiracy to commit. And 3 to 10 years for conspiracy to commit. Peggy Miller did not ever deserve to be a mother. And that's the only comfort that I have is knowing that she will never have that. Um, she stole a daughter. She doesn't deserve a child of her own, and she will never have one. Peggy Miller will spend 35 to 74 years in prison after pleading guilty to third degree murder and conspiracy charges. Miller was Jennifer's friend, and even when she had the opportunity to call for help, she didn't, and instead voted for Jennifer to be killed. They had numerous, numerous opportunity to help themselves and help Jennifer. Uh, they chose not to. Robert Masters will spend 30 to 70 years for pleading to the same charges. Melvin Knight and Ricky Smearns were previously sentenced to death. Angela Marinucci was sentenced to life in prison, and Amber Meitinger received 40 to 80 years. People tell me that I have to forgive to move on, but how do you give or, or how do you forgive someone for torturing or murdering your child? I just don't know how that's possible. I think maybe focusing more on forgiving ourselves. I think our biggest regret is forcing Jennifer to act like an adult while treating her like a child. I would go back and do so many things differently knowing now what I do. Ugh, that poor thing. God bless her. All right, guys, if you're still here, thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate you so, so, so very much. Um, if you have any suggestions, please email me, harding527 at yahoo.com. I know it's taken me a little bit longer to get things, to respond and to get things out. That's because school has started. Um, and the majority of my time is at my schoolwork but I am trying I promise you so I'm sorry I apologize again but I save everything I promise you I save everything and I'm getting to them I will get to them as I can with that thank you so much for being here thank you for being you thank you for your support if you haven't liked, subscribed, or commented yet, please consider doing so. And until next time, stay safe out there, guys.